We are finishing today, or beginning rather, we are beginning rather today the 12th lesson in an extended series of lessons on the church, the second version under that title called The Church. And we are studying today the first of two false teachings that have plagued and continue to plague not only denominations but among many churches of Christ uh, throughout the world, institutionalism and the social gospel. And just in a brief review of what we've covered so far or a brief mention, we began by defining the church as the assembly of saved people that Jesus saves throughout the world and distinguish the local church from the universal church when Christians worship and work together in a given location. We define the only true source of authority today, the apostles' teaching, in contrast to so many popular unauthorized sources of teachings such as the creeds and traditions of men and women that are often followed. We defined how to establish divine authority by direct command and statement, approved example, apostolic example, and necessary conclusions, and how that we can make judgments that are profitable to us or expedient, to carry out certain commands but not go beyond those commands lest we go beyond the silence of the scripture that we must respect if we are going to follow the word of God and that is often uh, gone stepped across by so many and then in lesson 9 we begin look or lesson 9 we began to look at how the church, a local church is organized under qualified overseers or elders assisted by deacons, servants that meet certain qualifications and that they have authority over that local church, those elders and not beyond. The work of a local church, those nine things, that the New Testament authorizes a local church to do in the areas of edification, spiritual building up in the faith, evangelism, spreading the gospel to the lost, and benevolence, helping needy saints. And last week we looked at the independence and autonomy and cooperation of local churches the last two Sundays, which we'll review in just a moment institutionalism and the social gospel, those two false teachings that pervert the church. And finally, the unity of the church is what we have in mind. I think it's a three or four part lesson that we will close with on unity. But now, the last two Sundays, we looked at how local churches are Uh, must be independent and autonomous. That is, they must make their own decisions and have their own treasuries and decide uh, what should be done and how much money should be spent on these things that God authorizes us to do without any outside interference from any other local church or organization. Independent safeguards a local church from error because no outside entity can force a local church that is independent from following those things that are uh, erroneous. Is Acts 15 a proof of centralization where local churches came together to decide everything for all local churches? No. It was an apostolic meeting and with the church in Jerusalem where false teachers had gone out teaching about keeping the law of Moses uh, and being circumcised to be saved to the Gentiles and the apostles confirmed what they had always taught and disavowed the false teachers and sent letters to those affected churches saying so. 
guided by the Holy Spirit. And we defined unauthorized and authorized cooperation where churches can cooperate without compromising their independence and autonomy uh, rather than centralization. And we looked at examples of unauthorized and authorized cooperation. The lesson today and next Sunday on institutionalism really goes along and, and repeats many things that are in the previous lesson, but it gets to the underlying error that causes all the problems with the cooperation schemes that so many, even among churches of Christ, seem to be deceived by and follow. Among churches of Christ, institutionalism is a common error that has perverted both the local church organization and the work of a local church. It is something that denominations have long practiced, and churches of Christ really just are mimicking or imitating uh, denominations. The problem with institutionalism, which we'll try to define in just a moment, the problem is that it's not widely understood and is also hard to detect and abandon because many people feel like it does so much good, these things that are done by this method of action and organization that we call institutionalism. But sadly, also, even among those who claim to oppose this error, which we claim to oppose, and which I have always tried to oppose all of my years, uh, now over 40, uh, of preaching the gospel, I uh, have tried to oppose this uh, error along with others. But there is now a trend among many churches of Christ who claim to oppose institutionalism that they are hesitant to teach against it. They don't want to teach against it. Although they don't support institutions directly financially uh, from their treasuries, they still don't want to teach against it because maybe they are afraid of offending people or whatever it may be or see that it's irrelevant. But the fact is, if we don't teach against this error or other errors, then people are ignorant of those errors, and the chances are they will begin to duplicate and fall into those errors. Local churches have shown dependence I don't know where we are on the slides, but I'm back at the point where local churches have shown dependence on them, these institutions, and we'll get back to our point. I don't know. They have shown uh, the dependence on the institution to train preachers and to provide their teaching materials. And this is among churches of Christ that claim to oppose institutions. All of this will become a little bit clearer when we define institutionalism, which we'll try to do in just a moment. The local church is sufficient. It has been designed by God who created the universe and humanity and all things. And the way a local church is to be organized is sufficient, completely uh, equipped, designed to do the work that God has given it to do without any need of institutions, without any social institutions whatsoever. God does not need our human wisdom to make the church work better, which is the whole problem in many cases where we, we think we know how to help God do something better, which shows more of a, a mix-up about us than it does about God. 
Institutions are not needed also to unify the church. We have the apostles' teaching for that basis of being unified. And when we define and we defend against this error, it will help us abide only in the apostles' teaching concerning how a local church should be organized and function. But before we speak any more about institutionalism, let's seek to define it. What is institutionalism? I don't know of any accepted formal definition, but there is a description that I've tried to cobble together from all that I can understand about the concept. And if you want to define it, this is my attempt at defining the idea of institutionalism. The belief that the universal church is a religious organization, that's where the whole problem is. When we know that the universal church is a relationship, is the relationship that individuals have with the Lord Jesus by faith, but that's the problem. The, the belief that the universal, that's not the problem. The problem is going away from that understanding. The belief that the universal church is a religious organization composed of local churches that combine together to accomplish their collective spiritual social work aided by social institutions that they depend on and or support. Now that's a mouthful, but it simply means that the church is viewed as an organization of local churches that must work through centralized institutions and sometimes other local churches uh, that they depend upon and that they support, that is financially support. This error can be believed and practiced completely or partially. And many times, brethren who don't even provide money to social institutions uh, have an institutional concept of the church in their thinking that we need to get rid of because it's, it's, it's not even scriptural to think of the Lord's church as an institutional organization of local churches. So that is the idea of institutionalism, thinking the local ch thinking the Lord's church, the universal church is an organization of local churches that functions together working through social institutions. Or we could have added other local churches centralizing the work and organization of these churches. That is basically the idea of institutionalism. So what do we have? We have corrupt leaders that corrupt local church organization. This is how all of this gets started. Any type of error, especially organizational error related to a local church, it happens that you have leaders in local churches that lead those churches to accept institutionalism as a way of, of doing uh, authorized church work as they view it. And the members go along with it. Instead of correcting their leaders, they go along with it for trusting in those leaders or because that meets their own desires as well to be like other people, other uh, religious groups who, where it is so popular. Acts 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul warned that uh, the Ephesian elders that they were not immune to following error and that they needed to watch themselves and their teaching lest they become corrupt and mislead uh, their members into uh, error. Acts 20, 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock 
among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And if the word of God is able to do that, why do we need anything other than the word of God to guide us, to guide church leaders, the elders, and to guide the saints, uh, uh, members of a local church, and in how we should live and worship and work together and be organized as God would have us in these congregations. We don't need anything else, and the Word of God does not point us to anything regarding institutionalism, and so it is a creation of men, that idea, and the implementation of it rather than God. Corrupt leaders corrupt local churches. They corrupt local church organization. When they exercise authority beyond the local church or when they submit to authority beyond the local church, that is human authority, to institutions or other local churches that they turn their decision-making over to those churches and their funds so that they can decide what work and how much is going to be done. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, Peter said, Shepherd the flock of God among you in that local church, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those, who, over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So these corrupt leaders corrupt the organization of a local church. Corrupt teachers are readily accepted by corrupt local churches because, again, they meet the desires of those congregations who are more worldly in their thinking and are more ignorant of the Word of God thanks to those corrupt uh, teachers among them, but they readily, in most cases, go along with the institutional thinking and practice, as well as other errors. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, 2 Timothy 4, 1, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience, that is, long-suffering and instruction. That is, be faithful to teaching the Word, correcting people and encouraging people. And the reason, he says in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for their, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. In other words, they'll find people who tell them what they want to hear, in, including the institutional error where they can be a part of big works and programs that get big glory and big results that are governed by wise individuals and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so Paul makes it clear 
that these corrupt teachers will be accepted by the corrupt congregations, thus ignorance of God's word will spread, and error will be accepted, and destruction comes upon both teachers and followers. It happened in the days of Hosea, in Hosea 4 and verse 6. Hosea 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And that is why we must ever search the word of God. Whatever is preached, whether by me or by any man, wherever they may be in this world, whatever is taught, uh, in the scriptures, we must search and we must seek to confirm whether in context these things are so. Like the Bereans were lauded for their attitude of eagerness and discerning and seeking to confirm what Paul was teaching. Acts 17 and verse 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And that is to be our attitude. And again, what causes so many churches to follow institutionalism, including so many so-called churches of Christ, is the idea of wanting to be part of a group of churches that are doing big things in Jesus' name that, that accomplish big results that they can brag and boast about before others. That's what happened to the nation of Israel in the very beginning of the kingdom of Israel uh, that became the kingdom of Israel when they cried out for a king. They rejected the authority of God and they wanted the worldly-minded Saul who became a complete disaster of a king. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 4. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint, appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. In other words, we don't care about your authority, God. We want to be like all the other nations. And many churches of Christ do not care about scriptural authority. They want to be like all the denominations, like those who they long to be like. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And what a disaster came uh, to the nation of Israel because of it. And a disaster has come to many churches of Christ that have long ago rejected the old paths in the apostles' teaching for the trendy, sinful uh, programs uh, that are baked over ideas that have long been introduced by the denominations long ago. The way they get away with it is they exalt humanity above that which is written, much like Israel exalted themselves above God, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. Now these things, brethren, Paul said, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you become, will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. 
And when we exalt people who above the Word of God, then we accept those teachings that are different from the gospel that has once been revealed and confirmed by the apostles. And what happens is we should reject that, those teachings instead of accepting them. Galatians 1 and verse 8, Paul said, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be exalted. No, he is to be accursed. He is to be accursed. So when we look at how institutionalism spreads or any type of error, we find corrupt leaders that corrupt church organization. In this case, uh, we find errors of corrupt teachers readily accepted by corrupt local churches. Desire of many local churches to be of denominations, and that's where it all begins to spread. Now we want to spend the last few minutes of our lessons looking at examples of institutionalism. And uh, we will repeat one that we mentioned that is so classic uh, in the last lesson and then bring up another one that we have not mentioned. Believing the Universal Church is an organization of local churches. That leads to the idea of centralized work. That is, that these units of the Lord's Church should work together in harmony with one another. It only makes sense if that's the way we view uh, the Lord's Church as a, a, an organization of local churches. If local churches are to work together as one universal church, then there must be centralized oversight and treasury. That is, we've got to turn decision-making over and treasury over uh, to an entity that has a th authority over local churches. We have to do that if we're going to follow the institutional idea. The two primary ways that churches of Christ have centralized their work are through social institutions and sponsoring churches. We'll get to the social institutions in just a moment as examples, and then we'll leave the sponsoring churches uh, till next Sunday, the Lord willing, to finish the lesson out. But social institutions, they are third-party organizations. They are funded by local churches and individuals to oversee and do work in evangelism, benevolence, and edification. They're organizations like Bible colleges and benevolent organizations. Their purposes sound so good to teach the Bible, to help the poor, that it's almost shocking to bring up the idea that they are not authorized to be uh, as they are and to be funded and to oversee the work of many local churches. The sponsoring churches, on the other hand, are local churches. And we could have put local church in quotes there, local in quotes, that assume oversight and control over a project that is funded by other local churches. So many who object to the idea of social institutions say, well, if we let the local church take oversight over many local churches and decide how the work of many local churches is to be done, then that would be okay because no social institution is involved. But the, the same mechanism, the same methods are involved. That is centralization of church oversight and treasury. The same error is involved except uh, the, the local church uh, expands its authority and treasury, its oversight and treasury, and thus becomes like a social institution. 
Now, in the final part of our lesson, just two brief examples. One we went over last week, but it's such a classic example that we mention it again. The American Christian Missionary Society, 1849, led by Alexander Campbell, uh, he created that organization funded by local churches to decide who and where the gospel should be preached in the United States, located Cincinnati, Ohio. But local churches are to decide for themselves who they are to support and uh, what preachers they are going to support, uh, how much they are going to support them and send money directly to those preachers. There is no indication in all the apostles' teaching that we are to have evangelistic organizations that are created by men that decide for us what preachers are be, being supported, where they are located, and so forth and so on. The Lord's church functions as God intended it without any of those type of institutions. Therefore, we conclude that they're not authorized. They're not authorized. If they were, God would have authorized them. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 13, Do you not know, Paul said, that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. That is, men can be supported to preach the gospel, to spread the gospel to the lost, and to edify the saved. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8 again, Paul said, I robbed other churches to take wages from them to serve you, and when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my needs, and in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you, and will continue to do so. So Paul makes it clear that without any, any uh, social institutions directing the distribution of support to evangelists, that the Lord's way work to spread the gospel throughout the world and without any human wisdom involved at all. We send money directly to the preacher as we determine in our local congregations and there is no third party involved in it. Then as a closing example of this idea of social institutions, examples of institutionalism, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief Effort Incorporated in my hometown, I'm shameful to say, in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, on the south side of the city, is where that is located. Now, that's if it still exists. I did not verify it. I know it existed a few years ago. But that's where it was located and may still be on the south side of Nashville. It provides needed supplies to both Christians and non-Christians who have suffered from natural disasters. That sounds wonderful, does it not? It sounds like a red cross for churches of Christ, does it not? Sounds wonderful. Funded by both local churches and individuals. It is wrong, though. It's not authorized because local churches are restricted to provide funds to needy saints not the world, first among them, and then they can send directly to the local churches where saints are in need if they have ability to do so after meeting their own needs among themselves. 
And all of that is done without any, any third party directing the work of many local churches and how benevolence is to be distributed among local churches or involving general welfare to the world. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16, If any woman is a believer, if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. And he talks about widows being something's wrong with the slide. I don't know what's happened. Oh, my, we have had a little bit of a disaster on our slides. Uh, my wife had been... We had a little problem, but we will go forward. So maybe you can follow with the audio, those who may be listening later, regarding to the thing. We apologize for that. First Timothy 5 and verse 16, If any woman is a believer, who is a believer, has dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed, those he let, talks about over 60 who have no family to care for them, so forth and so on. And they were to help those needy saints among them first, Acts 2 and verse 44, and all those who had believers were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as any might have need. That is, their families could not take care of them, and so the local church would step in. Then, as they were able to meet the needs in a local congregation among the saints there, then they could send directly to those churches that had saints in need in various locations such as Macedonia and Achaia in Greece, sending to the churches in, in, sending to the church in Jerusalem that had needy saints. Romans 15 and verse 25. Romans 15:25, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So the point is, all of that is done without any social institution third parties involved, no matter how good the intentions are. Uh, Christians as individuals, somebody says, well, how can we help the poor among the world in general. Well, that is up to individual Christians, not to a local congregation. It is up to individual Christians to do that as we have the ability and opportunity. Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of the faith. Then, that is what we are to do regarding helping those in the world. Now, what have we learned in our lesson? What is institutionalism? It is thinking of the universal church as an organization of local churches that has centralized work to be done through social institutions or uh, sponsoring local churches. And it is that problem that has been accepted, that error by so many, that has been accepted by so many in so many churches of Christ throughout the world. How does institutionalism spread? It spreads by preachers and elders accepting it and members accepting it, wanting to be popular, and that's how it spreads. Examples, we looked at two social institutions. 
one a evangelistic organization and another a benevolent organization, more modern example. And all of them are wrong because they take authority over local churches, oversight that they have no authority to have, and they have a centralized treasury of local churches that they have no authority to have. That is our lesson today. We know it was a little bit technical maybe and somewhat repetitive, but we had to begin to get to the underlying error that causes much of the problems, the, and we'll get to one in the future again, social, the social gospel. But next week, the Lord willing, we'll try to make it even more clear regarding institutionalism. This morning, we are glad to have an opportunity to be together, even online, and we are thankful. And we pray that the gospel may spread and that there are those who are listening that have not yet obeyed the gospel and who will listen later to this lesson. We encourage you to respond to the gospel of his grace before it is ever too late. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that he is equal in nature with the Father and the Holy Spirit, that he is creator, that he is sustainer of life and judge of all, that he is ruler of the nations and head of his church, if you believe that he is God, then repent of your sins, turn from those things to God, and confess him as the Son of God before men. And not only stopping there, as so many falsely teach, but be baptized as soon as possible, immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, through an obedient faith, trusting in the powerful blood of Jesus to cleanse you, coming up out of the water by the power of God to newness of life, that you may begin to learn and live as a Christian by the apostles' teaching. And those who are already Christians who have fallen away, let us turn and humble ourselves before God, turn from our sins and repent and pray, confessing those sins to God, and if need be one another, that we may be cleansed by the same blood that once cleansed us when we were baptized into Christ. If anyone is subject to the invitation of Christ, we would encourage all to come, all to respond at the earliest, and let us know by any means of communication if we might assist, as we now draw our lesson today to a close.